The way I see poker or cash game poker or any form of poker is for me, it's multidiscipline sports. Right? It's really, we have different disciplines and it's one key element to understand in which discipline we are and to get better at them step by step. Right? It's like my example is always decathlon, right? 10 different disciplines. Well, what do those athletes do as a training? Well, the last thing they would be doing is the whole decathlon, right? Never ever they would do 10 things in training. So obviously we need to play every day, which is pretty much just competing. But for learning reasons, well, well, you're working on, on throwing, you're working on, on like hurdles, you're working on, on long jump or whatever. So you try to be as precise as possible. And this is what I try to do. So I break down the whole game to certain elements. Hi, it's Ronchix, and the following is my conversation with Stefan Sonheimer. It's his second time on the show, and this time we dive deeper into optimal techniques for studying poker, discuss GTO versus exploitative play, talk about what it takes to reach the high stakes and remain successful there. We also outline the importance of staying flexible in your career as a poker player, and lots more. I'm sure you'll find useful ideas for yourself in this episode, and I'd appreciate if you click like, subscribe, and share this episode with a friend. Finally, please enjoy this conversation with Stefan Sonheimer. So, Stefan, well, what a pleasure once again to talk to you on the podcast. Um, thanks for making the time. Yeah, pleasure to be here as always. Awesome. Uh, I remember the last time we did the podcast, that was right when the pandemic was starting. We were like maybe a month into lockdowns already. Something like that it was April last year, wasn't it? Actually, I just I want to do that before we start to look up when it was because I actually can't remember. Uh, now I want to know it. So yeah, I think yeah, it, it was 14th of March. So yeah, it must be really okay. the start of the pandemic. Okay, okay, exactly. So there wasn't even lockdowns yet. Because yeah. I remember, you know, that was one of that was the episode where we had Toby as well. So it was the three of us True. in one he was conversation. Here in my room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and of course, yeah, hiding away yeah. from the camera. <laughs> that was, That's that was it. A bit, that was a bit ridiculous. And anyway, for those who haven't seen that episode, I think that was really cool. We covered so much, and there was a live audience as well. We were doing it live on Twitch, so a lot of questions from from the people as well. So it was a, a proper forum of a discussion. But anyway. It was basically just as the pandemic was starting. And I remember we were speculating on how it's going to affect us uh, and whatnot, making fun that, you know, well, whatever World Series are always going to go ahead and, and stuff like that, right? But um, here we are now, uh, more than a year later. What impact did it have on, on your life? It's a... It was a huge one. I just try to remember that that time frame. We we, yeah, we had that podcast last year. Um, I remember those like those bets on Twitter, like giving twenty to one odds on. Well, maybe the the WSOP is not taking place and stuff like that. And now looking back at that is is super weird. So I'm not a hundred percent sure what we talked about there regarding what was planned, right? So I'll, I'll just go back a little and say, hey, I moved to Germany uh, January 2020 together with my girlfriend with the goal of having a more regular life, right? I would enjoy that after all the traveling, life's super high rollers and just like living out of a suitcase all the time, just like finding your place close to, to friends and family. And like, I was looking forward to playing football again and and like have okay Tuesday and Thursday 7 p.m is training and that's it and do all kinds of, of that stuff um well that was not a thing right poker wise my plan was let's get a little more relaxed I started doing coachings um and I played a little on the side right it's like okay playing a little 500 little 1k selected 2k tables but it was not like reaching for the stars i want to play high stakes and then this is what i'm unsure about whether we covered that last time already but i think it doesn't matter too much that yeah probably not right 
it must have been the first lockdown that created the real first Corona boom. So mm -hmm. taking those plants, thinking about them, just all of a sudden they were, they were vanished, right? There's no football happening, no going out for dinner, no, well, meeting friends and family was, or still is not really a thing right now, right now in Germany, it's like, uh, Yeah, I can play it one like one household plus one more person. That's it. Like like even two and two is not really allowed, right? Once that one is released, I hope it will be a little better. It's like numbers are looking good now. Vaccination is going forward, but still. And um, then it was March, April last year, first lockdown, and well, the, I'm really calling it Corona boom in online poker that. People went crazy. It was like all over the place, just like the regular tables. It was just like 1K, 2K action was insane. Even more high stakes running as well. And then that's just me, right? Then the, the competitiveness in my heart was just triggered. I can't do anything pretty much, but sitting here in my room, uh, in my office and play poker. So uh, yeah, after all those years of playing tournaments, I got back into cash game, but I mean, I'm not super overconfident to say like, yeah, I'm just way smarter than everyone. So I was definitely not one of the best. So I needed to put lots of work in. Well, again, which was not the plan at all, but kind of the, the situation forced me into that. And uh, yeah, so that was pretty much my last year, putting a lot of work in, um, and then playing a lot to be here now where I am again, pretty much playing everything that is running up to 20K when I think it's worth it. So it's really that very, very different plan. And now Corona came and says like, okay, now you're a full-time high stakes poker player again, because that's at least what is triggered in me that this is my best option, which I enjoy. Actually, I yeah i enjoy it quite a lot so it's mm. uh it's lots of fun and like going through that process once more that in that way maybe reminded me of 2014 15 like those times where it was still for me about climbing up the stakes and reaching like one level after another and um yeah so how did this transition happen because i i know that i remember we talked with you I specifically remember one of the conversations we had after the podcast where mm -hmm. we were talking about how comfortable you are in the Zoom grind and grinding the, you know, mid-high stakes, like the 1K tables and stuff. And you were just like, oh, you know, it's it's so relaxing. I don't need to do much. I'm just mm -hmm. doing it and the money is coming in. It's just a, a nice day in the office and that's about it. And obviously to jump back into the high stakes, as you said, a lot of work needs to be done. You have to basically go back to the drawing board, study a lot, improve a lot. Uh, how did this happen, basically? I want to understand a bit more because from what I understand, you went from this comfortable position of like, I could just grind the mid stakes forever and it's going to be fine. And I can make basically a nine to five out of it and have a comfortable life, which is something that you were aiming to have. You moved back to Germany, you wanted to settle down, have something comfortable. And all of a sudden, this competitiveness triggered in you the need to step out of the comfort zone again. And what was the yeah. moment? Why did you decide like, okay, uh, I, don't need to, I, I don't need to be comfortable. I need to uh, reach for the top. I mean, it was... Like clearly the feel of leaving something on the table pretty much because, well, before, during the times I wanted to play, let's say I get up, uh, now I was like five months straight getting up with my girlfriend at 6.15 a.m. So um, then was this, then I started playing. Um, and yeah, usually in those times there is no traffic, right? Or it was no traffic before Corona happened. Um, I don't know whether that is the only influence or especially GG poker now getting bigger and bigger that they had more and more games running with uh, like a big Asian market and therefore a different time zone um, that it was like, okay, now it's, it's cool for me. If I, if I go to work and I play the games that are there and that is mid stakes, totally fine. That is like my, I have my competitiveness in a way it is smooth 
And uh, yeah, I can focus on the process, right? Play a session, review, play a session, review, um, instead of having that, oh, screening lobbies, trying to get a good seat, then only playing 50 hands. And then that, well, 50 hands on NL20K, they can decide whether you have a good month or a bad month, right? And that is just like, just for your mindset, a very, very different thing. But once you see that those games are running regularly, let's talk more about 5K maybe, right? That this is just running all the time. It actually, the people playing it are more or less the same people that I play in the Zoom 500 pool or or that I did play in the Zoom 500 pool uh, like a little back in time. And uh, sure, they are all good, but the games are running around, around weaker players and just like me for, I don't know which reason not playing it, just like didn't feel great. So it's more like, okay, um, I have the time now to put that work into in, uh, into my game uh, because, well, Corona is here. And uh, I mean, that was pretty obvious that life will not be that normal normal after like next week, right? Um, obviously, it, it was tough at all points to make any predictions, right? Right here, our summer was pretty much great in a way. Uh, and that was all cool. Um, but yeah, the last month, especially now here, the last five months, there was really nonstop nothing uh, that was possible. So it's really that, okay, it's possible to to put, for me, I have the time and the wish to put the work in again there. And then this is running always. Why shouldn't I play that? Right? It's more mm -hmm. that, okay, psychologically, from a mindset perspective, it's like, okay, I was prepared. I had a different plan, but now I need to pivot from that pretty much. Um, where I, where I know okay I'm I'm rolled for those games I don't have to be scared of anything it's all fine it's more just that a little mindset stress that you need to get used to again and a different way of yeah playing looking for those tables is just a big part of it um, and yeah now I could go more into detail what what happened over time because uh, Germany just like thought uh, about, hey, let's come up with new and new regulations uh, out of the blue, pretty much, where um, all my friends that play with me on Poker Stars, sorry to them that I always take uh, or like randomly take weird seats instead of sitting like across on the table when you open seat uh, with two people, that there's yeah no seat selection for Germans anymore, for example, right? I get the random seat. Sorry when I take uh, the Jesus on you. Uh, or like the, the one to your right that I get the recreational player whenever he shows up. Um, yeah, I'm sorry for that, but I can't do anything about it. I think uh, I had to, I don't know how many text messages I had to shoot out on stars because people were complaining, you mm. idiot, whatever, what the fuck is that? Can you reseat please? And I'm like, no, I can't, right? I, like I can't, literally it's not possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so that is, that is some stuff that, uh, yeah, party poker, I will not get a good seat ever. GG poker is uh, one where I get the random seat, uh, but I still get on the list somehow. And yeah, for example, another annoying thing right now is uh, I cannot I cannot join any wait lists. So it's mm. that because that's part of the rule. No, I mean, we don't need, we cannot discuss whether where that comes from and whether it makes sense. It does not. It's just some kind of rule. Um, and that comes from, okay, you cannot choose your seat, which is just like saying, I am I want to play this table, but not that table. It's kind of seat selection as well. So it's not possible to jump on any wait lists, which is, yeah, if I don't get a seat for a second, I will never get one. Um, that's just some disadvantages that I, I live with here and that changes things or changed things from October to December again, where I said, okay, no seat selection, Fuck high stakes again. Um, let's just play. Let's just play the mornings and op open seat anything I can, which was like 500 to 2k. Right? That was what I, what I was like. I was happy to battle with pretty much anyone, and then once the battle is fought a little, then then it's fine. Then then I'm open seating. So um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, like 5k plus, there are other end bosses seating, and I'm not trying to. To, to move them away that's not not my goal so um yeah that was that was pretty much my year um with a little little ups and downs and changes of plans privately and uh or like 
the, with the whole situation and then especially poker wise. Yeah, and those regulations are just so incredibly weird. As I don't know if they provided any justification, for example, for why no waiting lists. I mean, any casino, any live setting that you go to, you have waiting lists. In the casino, you're allowed to choose your seat. So why, uh, what's the reason for not allowing that in the online world? I have no clue. I think the main thing, because poker in that whole thing and everything I'm saying right now might be totally off, right? But um, that's just what, what I feel like, that first of all, people are making the rules. We have no clue of online poker, not at all. Um, that's just, I mean, you read that in every written written thing there, um, that the main thing is about um, like casino games online. And there it's just uh, about player protection. And then there's probably they have some thing stating that if you can chase something or, or like especially want to play that slot machine, that you get a little more triggered and that they transfer something like that over to poker and say like, okay, seat selection or selecting the game you're playing is a bad thing, right? It's like you shouldn't be hunting people or a certain spot because you're down there for chasing or whatever. It's just like mm -hmm. you, you should decide, okay, I'm ready to play now. I want to play for whatever. And, uh, and then I leave again and not like, yeah, I mean, obviously they don't take into account that poker is a thing that people can, can do profitably as well, but okay. Um, that's, I, d I don't expect that, but just rules that do not make any sense. And, um, yeah, now we are waiting for first of July when the when the big big uh, I don't know the English words uh, Glücksspielstaatsvertrag, uh, nice German word by the way. Uh, it is indeed. Like, yeah. the, the new the new laws will come into place. So we are in kind of a transition phase since October for online poker, mm -hmm. and now first of July is when everything should be settled, and there is even more to come. And right now there's a they are talking or want to introduce some kind of tax that actually kills cash game poker. Um, because I don't know uh, how it is with sports betting in other countries, but in Germany, um, all the things have like, you have 5% on winnings. So, and they want to just take the same rate or even 5.3% on every slot machine. Right? So, for example, you put in 10 euros in a slot machine, 53 cents are taxed. That's it. Right? So, yeah. actually, that kills those games because usually online they, they give you back like 97, 98% uh, of what you put in there. If Germany now says, okay, if you want to have the German legislation, um, then, yeah, okay, 94.7 is max and you didn't win, uh, like earn something as, as the operator so far. So, it's like... They are killing the games there. And in poker, you can imagine uh, they want to take that on every wager, right? Which is like playing the Sunday million and putting a 5% tax on it might still work out, right? Then it's not $109, but it would be $114 or something for Germans. I think that is still beatable, right? It's, I mean, that's not their goal to keep games beatable, but for cash game, um, actually, it's like one of the new rules in the transition phase is that you can see every time you log in, the, po the poker sites are forced to show you your um, yeah, total wagers and winnings and pretty much kind of a receipt for the last 30 days. We're like, let's talk about March. I don't know. I played stars probably was my least traffic and total wagers was like 500K. Right? So it's like, okay, I was up 8, 9K, something, whatever, um, just to see, okay, like if that poker tax was there already, um, then I would need to pay like 5% on those 500K. Like, okay, probably I had total wagers of like way above a million uh, on GG poker. So it's like, yeah, it's, I don't know. Uh, it's like a value added tax in a, in a way that just doesn't work for cash game. So it's, that's still under discussion what you come there, that there are hopefully some lobbying works out to, to just change that. Um, and if, yeah, if that will come, I need to, 
um, again, change plans probably. You basically yeah. need to move somewhere else. If I want to keep playing poker, I need to move somewhere else. Yeah. If, right. I mean, it's just cash game is not problem. It's not per- possible then if yeah. it stays like that. It's incredible how flexible you are, though. You know, it's uh, you change your situation. You make one plan. Life says no. You quickly change. You change again because, like, honestly, I think I feel like every time we talk with you, you're up to something new. <laughs> You've been playing mid stacks, then you're playing high stacks, then you're you know adapting already to this new situation. It's it's incredible, which is obviously something you have to do. Otherwise, you know, staying rigid. Um, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's it's definitely annoying, All right? So, uh, yeah, a big shout out to my girlfriend as well here. I mean, it must be even more annoying for her, right? Uh, it's like, okay, what to plan with? We were looking for for houses here in in like getting getting a nice house in like where I'm actually from. It's like one hour from here. Right? Uh, planning on maybe right. Let's let's get a house there. Let's see uh, what life brings. Right, and maybe settle down there a little, and I can. I can coach from there. I can play a little, um, all cool. Um, and yeah, now maybe, hmm, what about Vienna maybe again? Right? It's like a hmm. uh, totally different plan and, uh, or, or any other option where that is just, um, yeah, it's, it's incredible, but uh, well, I cannot complain, right? It's like poker gave me or us the, the, the freedom to have all that um, and yeah, it's it's kind of the reason that it's easy to to be that flexible as well. Right? So yeah. um, it's yeah, just, that's one, it's one just, thing that. No, go ahead. Yeah, lots, lots of lots of lots of coincidences that like okay, the year I decide to move back to Germany, yeah, more or less out of the blue, Germany decides to finally do something that needs to be done for ten years already, right? It's like uh, and uh, whatever, and so on and so on, and then living here in the city, wanting to enjoy it while Corona happened. It feels like, okay, like things are fucked up, but um, yeah, cannot complain. Mm. Yeah, that's the thing about poker. A lot of people getting into the career or already being a professional for a few years always have in the back of their mind this, I don't want to say fear because that's a bit exaggerating, but they at least think about what if the regulations change? What if this happens? What if that happens? Because historically, regulations changed in many countries a lot. Obviously, now the regulations in Germany are basically killing the game for the Germans. Um, But, well, obviously, United States and online, we all know how that worked out. But still, for people who are flexible enough, and let's say for those who in the United States just moved to Canada for a while or moved to Europe for a while or moved somewhere else for a while, they can still enjoy their poker career. So in a way, you have to stay flexible and you have to be ready to move. It's unfortunately, the the situation is the way it is. You can, like the governments, most likely cannot stop you from having this career but they can probably stop you from having it where you want it the way you want it and just getting nice and comfortable and settled and just hoping that nothing is going to change percent and that's that's the feeling that hurts the most right just like for people who just just love their freedom as much as we do just like getting like it's it's like a not like a sign like no you not here right it's like I had that feeling coming back to Germany, like having problems to every bank. I, I was like opening a bank account, a pretty big deal when you don't have a, a proper job. Like even me being now, I, I, uh, I, I'm lacking the English words there, but I have my own coaching company now, like everything's super official. So I'm like, I'm actually, uh, I'm a consultant, right? So it's like, since poker players are a business, I'm a business consultant. So uh, I'm like, I'm doing something but still, it's like, yeah. And what what else do you do, etc.? It's just uh, it's like not feeling welcome at all, like with the career I chose to have. But yeah, it's uh, it's now a very very different thing. What you what you said is hundred percent true, right? We need to be flexible, or like if we want to chase our let's call it ten, go, let's go ten years back and let's call it our dream, right? Uh, dream career, then 
that's just what is necessary, right? Other people have jobs, they need to move somewhere as well, or mm. don't even want to think about that. Just like you have a job, you lose it, you need to find a new one, right? It's like uh, very, very different problems. Um, and now for me, it's just a thing of priorities, right? For me, it's now, it's tough. I never wanted to make that decision between what do I want in life and, uh, well, does it make sense like dollar wise pretty much to have that mm -hmm. right i wanted to always keep the focus on what do i actually want right maybe not in the beginning too much but now more and more since we're not 20 anymore i'm 30 now it's like probably other things in life i know for you definitely right are more important than that stuff mm -hmm. uh where i say like okay i'm I make that choice. I go to Germany. I pay taxes on winnings. You could say like, okay, argue I'm losing 40, 45% in EV, right? I don't care. Now in October, uh, they came like, okay, we make life tougher for you. Tough to put that in numbers, right? No seat selection whatsoever. Maybe it costs another 10% or even more, I would guess. It's like, it's okay. I can still do what I like. I don't have to worry financially. That's obviously the reason why I can talk like that. But it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it, and then, but that's the big no, you cannot do what you want to do here. That's a very, very different step, at least for the feeling where now I'm forced to make a decision between that life priorities I'm having and like job in a way, right? It's like, okay, if I want to, to, to keep playing poker, I cannot do that and combine it with the way I want to live my life. Like, or I want it to at least, right? Things mm -hmm. can shift obviously. Um, but it's, that's a very, very weird feeling. Um, and it's like, it's a decision that, well, I'm still in a perfect position to make that, but it's still one that I hate, right? To say like, yeah. Um, and then even when we talk just on the, on the job side to say like, okay, what, what is the benefit of let's let's say the decision let's go to vienna again um hmm do i know that the games will stay good right? it's like okay now we were in a corona boom i i expect a, a, like a big drop in summer now summer was always a quiet month not only uh, or quite few months not only because everyone was in vegas we won't have that but well i mean just imagine Corona is kind of over in the countries that are relevant for online poker. Um, let's say in two months, I mean, who is staying inside to just like keep playing and do that as their hobby. Like I, I just cannot see it or it has to drop significantly. Then mm -hmm. we have October, November WSOP will be, I think it will be huge, right? Because everyone is as you, you told before we started recording, like even why you felt like playing live poker would be awesome now. Mm -hmm, uh, where I think yeah. this is how lots of people feel. And so what I cannot take, like what maybe other people can do is like, okay, I have EV X. If I go there, uh, what about taxes here and there and make some kind of EV calculation. So maybe let's do that. I had talked to my girlfriend, let's do that for three years. It makes so much sense where, I cannot guarantee a shit, right? So I, I'm always focusing on, okay, what's the, the life I want to live right now? Um, and definitely poker is a part of it, right? It's not like, okay, yeah, sure, fuck it. So I do something else. It's, I love it too, way too much for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's great the way you explain it that you need to sort of weigh the probabilities of things happening. The probability of the games, uh, game still being there, the probability of... Uh, well, the legislation in the other country not changing because that, that also would be a yeah. bummer. Imagine you move there and see, then, see you uh, in Malta soon, right? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, as you said, uh, with time, now you're thirty, and and imagine when you're more in my situation in, in my late thirties, with with the family, with the kid, etc. You're becoming less and less flexible in so many regards, both in regard of uh, when can you play? Because you you earlier were talking about you know, with your morning schedule, sometimes find uh, hard to find games, right? And there's obviously historically not much action uh, during midday uh, in the European time zone, right? But whereas when you have the family situation, it's pretty hard. Like you're not going to be able to grind at night um, and then, you know, sleep during the day. 
It's just yeah. unlikely to happen, right? I mean, I know some people who do that. I'm not convinced that the sacrifice is worth it because the, their relationship is definitely suffering and um, maybe their priorities are a bit different in terms of how much time they want to spend with their children, right? Because yeah. but to be honest, like that's, you blink and you miss it, right? You, you Sure, you can just think that, well, you know, I'm going to play with my son or with my daughter when, when she's like uh, 12. Yeah, honestly, it's way too late. Yeah. Right. You're just missing I mean, out. I remember, I remember one talk uh, with a with a friend of mine uh, who has uh, two children. Or at that point of time, just like I don't know whether it was the first or the second, um, was just just newborn. Mm -hmm. And uh, asked him, "How do you do it with your with your wife or girlfriend? I'm not even sure. Um, how do you do it? Because I see you grinding so much. Right? As a tournament player, he doesn't have any option pretty much, but starting in the evening. Um, and well, it's like, that's just something you need to clearly communicate, right? It's like, it's like you have a, a real job and you are a night shift, even if you're at home, right? That like, I asked him, is it like, okay, she takes over on the day when you're sleeping and you can do something on the side? Like, no, definitely not working, right? Grinding a tournament schedule and like let's say having a baby back there is is not a good idea. So it's like he said, like no, it's like pretty much they decided that she has pretty much the work of a single mom, and he just works double, right, for a certain amount of time. Let's say half a year in the winter time to then like shift or like take over and really enjoy the summer. Where I think there are different options for depending on the priorities every every single person has. Um, but it's, it's just something so important to, to, to communicate and to, to be clear about it. Right. It's just something I imagine. Okay. Right. Uh, let's say my girlfriend would love to have a dog. Right. And obviously she thinks, well, I'm at home anyways. Right. So it's not a big deal if she's at work and I can take over. We're like, yeah, I'm still working here. Right. And it's probably not eight hours sitting down, right? It's like I make my breaks because that's part of the job to make session breaks. But I don't want to be forced in that moment to like have two, three, whatever jobs uh, at the same time, right? And in that moment, if it fits somewhere else in, that's perfect. But that's just, just something that, um, yeah, just needs needs to be, be discussed. And it's something that, well, people need to be clear about. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine combining tournament schedules with having a kid yeah. in Europe, especially <laughs> with this time zone. It's just absolutely, absolutely insane. Because I, I remember there was an episode, like my son was maybe six months old or something. And like, obviously I was in a situation where it, same as you are now, of you know, waiting for the game to start all, all day, right? And just open sitting at the tables and then you're just waiting for somebody to join. And it happened so that I was taking care of him and the game starts. And I end up playing the 10K game for like an hour and a half with the with the kid on the lap. And then at some point you're like, oh shit, I need to change diapers. And like, I'm going to sit <laughs> out now to do that. And uh, although it was funny because I, I was basically... I was laughing uh, that you know my my son's first session uh, ended up plus twenty five k or something like That's that. Good so job, he's, son. He's, uh, yeah, exactly. Good job. I was like, maybe I should play with him more often. Like, it's a maybe good it charm. relaxes you inside, right? It's just <laughs> honestly it's not. Smoother, it was the smoother so decision stressful. making process. <laughs> it's so stressful, but um, at least he was at that age when he's. Um, not super active like right now it would be absolutely insane but now he's he's old enough to understand that you know if my office door is closed it's closed for a reason so mm. you know at least we don't have to negotiate that but so anyway yeah what i was saying that at some point life uh makes you less flexible whether you like it or not because like for me well, still now, if I had to leave a country, let's say Malta changes the legislation, which is very, very unlikely, but let's say for, you know, just theoretical, um, they change legislation and I am forced to move uh, for tax reasons or otherwise, it would be so difficult because now we're already looking for a school. 
um, you know, and now it's not only you moving. Now it's not only yeah. you and your girlfriend or wife of like, hey, do you want to move somewhere else? How about that? But now you also have to think, okay, what are the school situations where, you know, we're putting, pulling the little one out of one country to another different culture, maybe different language. It just becomes more and more complicated. So uh, right. I but feel like once you want to decide to do something like that, you should always have a good plan, which especially in our business is not possible to have at all. Oh, right? yeah. It's like, we can't, I cannot make, like if someone asks me, where do you see yourself in five years? I have no clue. I know it. whatever plan I make now will change in six months, probably. Right? Yeah. It's just, that's like, that unsteadiness is the only prediction I can make. In right. right. And actually, you know, now, now I think, which is important to stress, right? You've, you've been talking about paying taxes and having or, or your situation really, uh, really clear with the authorities. And I am of the same opinion. Like you have to do it. It's not always easy as a poker player because in some countries the legislation is so vague that basically nobody even knows what's the correct way to pay taxes, etc. But it's totally worth to legitimize that income because when it's legitimate, at least it's easier for you to move. Imagine if you didn't pay any taxes and basically all your income is just whatever, poker starts to scrill and then you're using the credit card everywhere and you have no real banking, no banking history, no no cash flow to, to, to show. Like try to move to another country where they're going to say, okay, well, we need your bank statement to rent you a flat or a house. Mm -hmm. We need to see your stable income. We need to see like the six months uh, cash flow, right? And I'm talking about moving to a civilized place. Obviously, you can move many places in the world where, you know, cash is king and you just show them that you have a credit card and you're already pretty much like live where you want. But if you're staying within Europe, or even North America or wherever you, you are in a civilized part of the world, not having um, any track record with, with taxes, with legitimate income, that's basically a no-go. Yeah, it's like, oh, dot, like, and that's the feeling you get, like talking to everyone. It's like, uh, might be dodgy anything or a drug dealer or, or it's like kind of that thing, right? It's, mm. it's, yeah. yeah, he seems weird, cannot. I mean, I remember the first time I was in Vienna trying to open a bank account, actually going going to one bank that I like that worked for lots of poker players. And I just even went there, like exact same situations, like lots of these people. And she just didn't understand. Like I was treated like a, a guy who just loses everything in some kind of slot machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Uh, and I, well, it's like just she went to her boss and like didn't even let me negotiate anything like or talk to anyone else. And she was just like, I cannot give you a bank account here today. Please leave. Like, really, mm -hmm. it's like insane. And then uh, I don't know. Um, I needed I needed pretty much uh, a relations there to finally get that done where it's. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. I tr like that's the bad feeling. Always. I try to make everything as as like correct as possible, but sometimes it's, it's, I don't know, it's just very, very tough. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. And I have this experience as well of just being uh, completely, well, in a way mistreated by, by the service of the bank. As I, I tried to open a, a bank account in a, um, in a German bank. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe that's something with German or Austrian banks and their customer service. You know, they're not famous for it. Let's put it this way. But so I went through all the KYC and all the like sending all the documentation, the tax returns and whatnot. Um, and I kid you not, I still have that email somewhere. They like their customer, whatever person sent me an email and saying, we will not open uh, a bank account for you. Uh, ask the German legislation, we are allowed to choose which customers we open an account or not. And we don't need to explain anything to you. <laughs> that's it. That was the whole email. I was yeah. like, well, well, okay, thank you. Yes, that's I uh, have the same, exactly clear. same email in my, in my uh, uh, inbox for 100%. Yeah. And it's so funny because you're like, okay, well, yeah, I 
okay, I understand. <laughs> you really explained it well, and uh, thank <laughs> yes. you. you. You have it a good day as well. <laughs> it's pretty clear. And like the you know, the fun fact it, is that actually that is not true. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. In Germany, they need to give like some kind of basic account to everyone, right? They always try exactly. to get around that. Yeah. But the bank I was, they had it even in their terms and conditions that they don't want to have like. 0.5, 0.4, I don't know, right? Uh, we don't do any gambling related business. We're like, okay, then that is the wrong bank for me. I don't like, but that's like, it's not that for me, that's all like authority kind of bullshit stuff, but that's not the same, right? Like I cannot use the argument that the state uses that, well, for me, it's not gambling, right? Because I'm winning. Right? I would like to have that in written. This is the reason why I need to pay taxes, right? For me, it's mm. not a game of luck because I'm winning. Um, and to take that to the bank, hey, for me, it's it's not not luck. Like I'm I'm not a gambler, so you need to take me. But it's like it feels like every every uh, thing you're you're at, you get the worst for yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. Out of the weird situation, but but look at it from a different perspective. If it's a game of luck. You're one of the luckiest people in the world because you know you've been winning consistently for how many years, you know, and appearing on all sorts of major events. Uh, it's just such a ridiculous notion of. Well, first of all, I mean, obviously, these people are not educated on on what it is as a career. Yeah, I mean, and we and we know that from our personal experience. Like whenever you meet somebody new and you need to explain to them what you do for a living it's always the same kind of roller coaster of emotions from you can see it in their eyes like first of all some people would just immediately react of like okay i don't really want to have a conversation with this person seems like something <laughs> fishy is going on or some people would be like oh you can do it for a living oh my god and then obviously it comes to um, so how often are you like broke or something like that? You know? uh, it just reminds me of a, I mean, random story. Every one of us has experienced like first haircut I got after, after the last lockdown, pretty much mm -hmm. when, when here, uh, they, they, they were allowed to open again and I was not prepared. Usually I have something because they always ask what I'm doing. If I go there 11 AM in the morning, like, Oh, you have free today. I'm like, I should just say yes. And I'm like, I don't know, like have some, some job in my backhand that in case they ask, because once that is the topic, who, and there I was unprepared and I was like, fuck, I, I don't have like a basic game plan because student is not really working anymore. And here I don't know anything about like the, the unis in the city I'm living. And, and like, I don't know. I can't pull that bluff in like a random situation there where it, I mean, it would obviously work out, but um yeah and i was just like honest but in a way like you don't want to you don't want to show off yeah uh yeah just google me i'm a pretty big deal right it's like uh, <laughs> right. It's, i don't know uh it's, and then you get those questions usually like okay can you do that for a living right is it enough to live and uh but that was like the the typical guy like what's the word for people doing haircut uh hairdresser or oh, barber, right. barber, the maybe for, for men, rather barber. Yeah, uh, that was more the typical hairdresser. Right? <laughs> okay, Someone more who, of a hairdresser. <laughs> who, likes, like who likes to talk. And he like just took that one and started talking about, well, he often goes to a casino playing blackjack and he's pretty successful. And I'm like, okay, he kept okay. talking for like 10 minutes about that. And I just like... Uh, <laughs> Fuck, I cannot have that conversation here. No, I'm not saying anything against it. And uh, yeah, just gave it a good smile and uh, yeah. asked whether he plays colors or numbers or... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was deep strategy talk for sure. Yeah, it's funny. I'll give you a pro tip. Like whenever somebody asks me what I'm doing uh, and I'm in that situation, I always say like, Ah, uh, just an office job. I, I work on a computer, which is absolutely true. It's an office job, and I work on a computer. And it sounds so boring. Nobody follows up. Yeah. Because if if that's what you do, nobody's gonna like. Oh, so is it like Word or Excel or what do you do? The presentations <laughs> or do you do a yeah. lot of Skype and how does that work out for you? <laughs> so that's pretty oh, okay. much the conversation stops there. And I never feel that I'm lying because that's that's the honest truth. I work on a computer and. Uh, 
I do have an office at home. So you know, what, that's what else true. do you want? Yeah, that's like my mistake was always that uh, my, my standard answer since I'm here in Germany is just like the honest one, which, well, I'm, I'm self-employed, but that raises questions. Oh, cool. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. right? It's like, that's exactly what I don't want to have. Uh, it's yeah, like, so yeah. Uh, office yeah, job well, is a good one. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, not even office job. I just work on a computer. That that kills all conversation. Trust yeah. me. And then occasionally they would go as far as figuring out, like, instead of that I work for a company on a computer, that I do it as a self-employed. But it's still so boring that it doesn't progress yes. anywhere. <laughs> yeah, databases and stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. But after, <laughs> you know, I I look at the charts all day. That's that's what I do. Yeah, try to look at the charts all day. Yeah. That's yeah yeah so yeah but it's funny that you know you are in a profession where there is so not enough of information out there so that you have to basically either waste a lot of time trying to explain to people what you do and there is no benefit in that or you have to pretend you're doing something else just to avoid that conversation yeah. and then no wonder you know everybody is struggling with the banks and everybody's struggling even with the tax authorities sometimes because they don't even know exactly what's going on. Such a nice talk. Uh, I think like it was last week, two weeks ago. And um, I had uh, someone over uh, at my place to shoot a video actually here for, for Poker Code. We'll probably talk about that later. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he's actually one of the highest uh, awarded magicians Oh, wow. uh, I don't know from just here or, or worldwide. He was like at America's Got Talent, for example. Uh, uh, like this is just what everyone, and that's exact. we had exactly that conversation. He has a super weird job and mm -hmm. gets like those weird questions where, well, he won these and those and those awards on like magician, whatever things that no one knows about. And he's mm -hmm. like just the guy who was at America's Got Talent, which is like in his in his CV, not like, Def doesn't make his his personal top 20 probably at all but it's just like what people know him for it's like exactly when it's like oh yes i play blackjack as well you do something with casinos right poker mm. this is what it triggers in me and just how he is prepared for that stuff uh, especially that that moment where he talked about as well where he tries to be like very gentle and not be like some kind of show off he could say yeah like that uh What's I always forget, uh, David Copperfield is inviting him when he's in Vegas, right? That kind of stuff. We're like, okay, he drops it somewhere that not he's not on the street, like doing two tricks. Like he he's like doing big shows and stuff. Um, and and uh, yeah, but then still the question he often gets or like that one that he lately gets like, yeah, like my little daughter, it's her birthday next week. Can, can you do something there? We're like, I'm a, oh, um, um, but yeah, he was happy to have me there as well too. To, we did a fancy card trick and I don't know how it works and fuck him for that. <laughs> <laughs> that was very fun. Oh, he's and a so, true magician. He didn't reveal the secret. Yeah. Sorry? He's a true magician. He didn't reveal the secret to you. So. That's yeah. another thing that people always talk about. And he's like the biggest not fan of that. It's like, oh, a magician cannot show his tricks. No, it's like he's actually ready to explain all kinds of that. It's like, yeah. is it say, those magician meetups and everyone is like some super nerdy guy like i i, I think who is who's like from from um how i met your mother is uh, is like who is a little is one of them is a little into uh yeah barney is, is into into um that a little if, if I've, I've just like randomly sometimes watching that uh, was barney into magic well maybe i mean barney was into magic yeah yeah I remember like, there was a, a thing where Barney was playing a casino game with the Chinese, some sort of yeah, game where nobody that understands well, their yes, <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> That yes. was pretty funny. That, that's it. We're like, just, just want to say that picture of where he, he's at some kind of meetup there as well. And it's just like that super nerdy thing. This is how it is. And, and uh, yeah, he just explained to me, well, that's just, it is like that, but he's not like that at all. Like he doesn't know which trick comes from which guy. He focuses on making that stuff mm. as good as possible. And make it in a way that it comes like more of the acting part and talking to it like that it is good on stage actually like I, mm. he can show me the trick i can train it but i like there's no way that i can make it somehow good right it's like 
even now the biggest shows he probably knows most of the tricks what like the the main thing is that it's about but still it is special for him seeing it because it's the way that it's presented etc it's just like a mm -hmm. very very different view on things um it's it's like like as if people think about poker players that oh you you like need to know the numbers all the time like odds and stuff and i'm like yeah, i mean sure i know how often a flush draw gets to the air right but like in game i'm probably not ever thinking about a single number ever kind of mm -hmm. right? it's like okay i see bet sizing but it's not like uh yeah his range has probably 27 percent equity and blah and like no clue right um but yeah, yeah. that was very very fun <laughs> yeah and it's funny with with our professions which are hard for people to understand and they're not tangible right if somebody says they're doing a sport even if you don't really understand the sport what is the sport but they understand okay this guy's doing something physical because yeah. like it's unimaginable that let's say somebody meets your favorite athlete of all time usain bolt right and they would ask him let's let's imagine they don't know who he is but they would ask him what do you do for a living well i i run i i'm a sprinter it's unlikely that they're going to say, oh, do you want to run with me? Like, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's just run, right? <laughs> Whereas for magicians, like, oh, show me a trick. That's the first thing, right? That's As the if first they thing. were just yeah. waiting for you to ask them to show the trick. Or for poker players, oh, yeah, you, you play poker as a professional. Well, we play on, like, Sundays. Do you want to come and over? you show me your poker face. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, or, yeah, show me your poker face. That's Classic the worst. One. <laughs> That's the worst because uh, I mean, Jesus, what do you reply to that? Yeah. Oh man, but it's it's funny how people, because they don't understand what it is really, they feel okay with like asking, like, "Oh, come over and let's play some cards." I mean, it's the weird perception with poker, especially. I think like just from the game itself or what our work looks like, um, it's very very similar to other games coming to to chess for example right mm -hmm. let's say you go uh to have a haircut a haircut and you say oh what are you i'm a chess grandmaster and i like make that for a living it's like just that perception like that view in the in the hairdresser's face just imagine how different it would be like it will be like mm -hmm. oh you must be a super smart whatever kind of guy but like yeah. oh you little degen is more the the look we are getting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, I mean, let's let's like some very very negative talk and like uh, see, seems like as as if our life was bad. I feel like, but it's no, uh, no, not at all, not at all. I mean, to me, this is not even negative. I'm just, you know, it's it's funny. It's part part yeah. of the life, which is the funny part because, well, that's just the career we chose. And I mean, I've been dealing with this this for like. 13 years or, or more and it doesn't bother me one bit and i don't think we should be on a mission to educate the general population about what it is yeah. to be a poker player definitely. but i definitely because like how we got to this point in the discussion is it is important to be flexible it is important to be able to move if you have to because sometimes you have to because the government's not always making rational decisions when it comes to treating poker players fairly because let's let's face it the, the industry is so small that nobody cares like mm -hmm. if all poker would be forbidden around the world like you can't play poker for money at all anywhere in the world well there would be like a bit of buzz on twitter and that's it like there's no big movement or etc we might think this is a huge community well in the big scheme of things it's not we're lucky yeah, to be in a niche where we can make our passion a business and it's just like we're already so lucky that we, we shouldn't <laughs> complain really all right but still coming back i can't stress this enough of making your situation legitimate is just so important because if you fail to do that you know when it came, comes the time to to move or to be flexible or to just open another bank account you know it's gonna be really difficult so for those guys in their early 20s who think like, ah, I can, nobody cares. I'm just going to do my thing and I forget about the taxman, et cetera. And maybe paying uh, and making everything legal makes sense. 
anyway, I feel like I feel like the two old guys in poker so is basically say you better do because oh, that's old that's guys not how I felt. It's yeah, so that's sad not... that we're old guys in poker. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, me more true. than you. Me more than you. For yeah, sure, but, but even for me, it's true. Now I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Seeing seeing the young guys come up as well. Actually, that... high stakes cash is still lots of old guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that even that is, I don't want to say changing because I mean these old guys are not going anywhere anytime soon. But it is clear to see that the new blood that's coming into the game i mean we cannot in the long run we cannot compete with these guys with the amount of passion they bring and the amount of dedication and the crazy hours they're willing to put in the benefit that we have is that we did that work already one one day long ago yeah. right so that's basically they have a lot of ground to catch up but there's always going to be somebody who's willing to put in more hours um more sweat into into studies than well definitely than i am um and that's <laughs> fine you know it's it's just a natural progression because even though like you can't be too old to play poker i don't think that i mean look at doyle brunson right obviously he's not crushing the online games or any of that and it's it's even questionable whether he's crushing the live uh, poker games but he's doing all right um so you can't be too old for that, but your life circumstances, the, the older you get, the more they change for most people. I mean, some people obviously still live the same lifestyle when they're 45 uh, as they were when they were 22, but those people are are rare. Yeah, I mean, 100%, and that's, that's just something where but I, I remember reading old blog posts I did in like 2015, right? Which is just mm -hmm. like, like traveling back in time and looking in my, in my own head. Uh, and so I remember that was when um, stars announced that uh, supernova elite thing, that that won't be a thing anymore. And right. I was like, uh, yeah, probably poker won't be a thing for me in like two years from now anymore. Right. So something else happened. And if I, if I have to talk about it now, well, I don't think that poker will be a thing in my life in 10 years, probably. I mean, it's always a small part because of all the relations and the people I met through it. Uh, and I will always be ready to have a little nice game, but just like a, that it plays a role like it does right now, I don't see it as all. Oh, obviously that might be totally wrong again. And in 10 years I'm watching that podcast and I'm like, what the fuck? Uh, I'm still here playing those cards, uh, whether I like it or not. Uh, um, but that's 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 interesting to see, like how priorities shift, what you think about, how how you plan your life, if it's planable at all, uh, etc. What what is important for you at a certain point of time? Where right, Doyle is the perfect example. Or like, I mean, we can take Phil Helmuth and Daniel Negreanu, different age, but as well that gave like their the whole dedication of their life to that game. Right? It's like for them everything. Where I guess the two of us are. Are very different when it comes to that right I, mm. I mean that's like okay it's it's interesting i like playing but then i like not playing playing a lot as well right so it's like yeah. i've i don't want to be that my thing 100 percent. yeah yeah and that's that's the thing there's there's a lot of people i can think of who are fully dedicated and like even after playing for 10 plus years are still as eager to learn as eager to to work as they were uh, when they started, but um, yeah, it's definitely not me. I mean, I mean, I remember the first maybe like three, four years, and the amount of time I put into poker in the beginning of all that. First of all, that was unhealthy. <laughs> That's <laughs> let's. Uh, it's clearly unhealthy. So, I if I had to go through that again. I hope I would be smarter and not not do it as unhealthy as I did with like these crazy 20 hour days and like not enough sleep and just going for like insane long sessions and travel and, and whatnot. But um, I don't know if it's possible to achieve big success in any other way. I don't think so. I mean, I remember, especially my time in, in living in Brighton, what was that, 2015, 
until 2017, something like that, um, where I had I was injured moving there and not knowing anyone around but the small German community. But well, not doing any sports, not nothing. So everything I had was poker. And that was lucky me the only time in life where I felt like, okay, poker is everything I have because then that dictates how you feel, right? It's like if I'm on a big downswing, but I go to my friends play football, everything is great, right? If I don't have something like that, my, my, my head will keep thinking about, well, I have a big downswing. I need to work my way out of that. It's like how unlucky I am, uh, et cetera, where, where I always, I don't know, I remember really, really big headaches. Whenever like my, my, my brain is just like, when I was doing too much, I, I start getting them, right? I even had that in live poker. I don't know when it's just too many impressions. When I, I was eight tabling Zoom for Supernova Elite, I think that's it does something to you. I mean, everyone is different there. But for me, that was just like playing 15 hours and you're kind of in the zone. I feel it coming. And then it's just like total power cut in a way. It's like, mm. it's like, I don't know whether you experience something like that, that actually your body is telling you even you're doing something that is really not good for you right now. Let it be wrong, wrong food before, like, or not even not eating, right? It's like just maybe a snack here and there, and but but putting the brain work in there for 15, 20 hours straight, whatever, um, and and not caring about yourself, but just caring about your your poker decisions and that that I mean was definitely not not the healthiest lifestyle, but. Uh, was just part of it where like, I guess, especially in those moments, it's like where you learn a lot as well. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. And it's definitely true that, you know, the body does try to tell you something. I, uh, I have two examples of that. Well, one example more, more extreme, which is basically after, I think my first year uh, in Vegas, I spent there three months. So it was basically three months in Bellagio. I was just grinding oh, a lot. <laughs> Three months in, in Bellagio. I mean, I didn't stay in Bellagio. I we we were renting a house, so at least living off the strip and um, had to commute to work. So at least there is some separation. Uh, I wouldn't be able to stay in the casino hotel for for three months. I've I've tried two weeks, and that's already too much. Because yeah, yeah. at some point you just want to escape all that and just want to sit in the garden and jump in a in a pool just alone without uh, without the crowd of the casino or the hotel but anyway so i spent those 3 months completely burned out to, towards the end of the trip i was absolutely burned out like the classic burnout of no energy i mean no energy to such an extent that i basically the my last few days in vegas i just spent on the couch watching tv and that's it i didn't move um, and the next year, coming back to Bellagio, like the moment I stepped into Bellagio, that smell hit, and it's like the body kind of yeah. like you feel you're under attack. You know, I literally started almost to panic, and I'm I, I'm not a person who easily panics or or you know becomes stressed. I'm a pretty calm, pretty calm person in general. But that was like a instinctive reaction, almost like an animal reaction of. We're under attack. This is not a safe place. Let's get out of here. And it, I, I found it so fascinating. Because, and then thinking back, like, obviously, it's not surprising because I was really hurting myself there for those three months of, like, no sleep, bad food, constantly there in that environment with all the noise and all the bright lights and, and whatnot for, for three months in a row. And obviously... I felt that reaction after being away from it, but how many people actually hurt themselves, even if they're in their home office environment, of just pushing themselves too hard, neglecting the sleep, neglecting the nutrition, and obviously hurting their prospects of becoming a better player because your mind and body needs to be aligned for you to actually achieve something in the long run and sacrificing your health in the short run is a mistake I see a lot of people do. And eventually it leads to burnout. And eventually it leads to depression so, yeah, or what have you. I especially feel, I mean, not feel that or see see that when it's when it's about playing. It's that 
fake necessity of like, I cannot leave that guy now, right? It's like, let's say you had a six session, four in the morning, you still have two tables open and one whale is like spazzing it off, right? But you you are totally over it. But then it's like, you cannot like that. That's what I mean with like fake necessity of staying. I don't know. Or like, well, that spot will probably come up again. Or maybe it's not the best spot if you like, what are you giving right now? It's not, you're not giving 30 minutes of your time. No, it's 30 minutes of your time right now where you feel shit and pretty much, uh, yeah, just feel that you should do something else. Where I don't see that with the studying too much because, well, when studying, it's like not about the hours. It's like when you, there, there's that, that, certain feeling that you are not learning anyways right now Mm -hmm. it's like and then you stop it but with playing long sessions well with tournaments you are forced into that spot uh i remember that we're in the biggest spot right you play heads up in a tournament uh online it was like scoop time 8 30 in the morning and uh i get their their heads up in one we are like 40 50 big blends deep like in a time where that was pretty much what i was pretty, pretty good at relatively, right? Uh, I have no clue nowadays anymore, but I was really confident and played against another rack, but who I thought is is like clearly, clearly worse where it was, yeah, 8.30 in the morning. And I just felt like, okay, I should never deal with him here, but I ended up doing it because just like I was doing rough estimations on what my hourly is now just playing for the, the edge I think I have. And it was like, it was good, but definitely not worth playing in that moment. It's like, could be some other part of, of like making poker a business, right? Everything around poker to say like, okay, I want to work on that fitness level that in this moment where it's about the most money that I'm still fit. And like that way where that was never me, I probably had like six or seven beers in my head already as well. So it's like, it's a, it's a different story, but it's just that that overall picture where, yeah, I think everyone has those kind of stories where it's just, yeah, usually you stick to it and, and just, yeah, make those short-term sacrifices because you feel like something is more important now where, yeah, um, yeah the next day you you probably realize that you made the wrong decision. Yeah. Well, in in that sense, it's good that the people who are getting into poker right now or just in their early stages of the career, they have so much more information from others like ourselves sharing their experience and basically telling, well, you know what? That was me. I I played those 20 hour sessions. I I did drink beer uh, mid session. Um, I did stay too long for the fake necessity of of staying around. I mean, we all did it. And I mean, probably still do it occasionally, right? Because it's, it's not a, it's not as easy to make good decisions in table selection and other decisions when you're exhausted at that point, which is basically why you should leave because you can't even make those decisions. Do you really think you can make good poker decisions? (laughs) <laughs> right so that's that should be obvious but i feel like at least for the younger generation there is much more information out there so if they're willing to listen they can learn from others mistakes and we are still in such an early early stage in development of poker as a career um career w- with longevity i i often use the analogy of like the early golfers we can still see them on the tour with their cigars, you know, and drinking whiskey in the clubhouse. Yeah. And now it's all about nutrition, the sleep, the exercise, stretching, weightlifting, and they're true sports people, right? You look at them, you know, you know okay, this guy really works on, on himself, on his physique, on, on his uh, endurance, on his recovery, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, nowadays there's more and more poker players who actually go that route and take things seriously, including nutrition and and all the other things. But you know, when if we look back ten years ago, like nobody talked about you know, it, nobody I did mean, it. Just think of like uh, poker after dark or or high stakes cash or whatever it was called. The way the top stars were presented on the table. I mean, mm. <laughs> it's 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 a shit show of like, yeah, unhealthiness pretty much. Yeah, yeah. 
and all the prop bets, like the crazy prop bets that Phil Locke was doing, yeah. like completely destroying himself, right? Uh, Sammy Farha always sitting there with his unlit cigarette, which oh. he still does <laughs> occasionally. Like, yeah. it's so funny to see his signature cigarette in, uh, in Bellagio in the games. It's but, definitely fun. Yeah. Um, so let's get back to what you said about you know when you're when you made the decision okay i'm gonna study for the high stakes games i'm gonna try to get back to that environment what was your game plan like how did you fig how did you set your study routine study approach did you have a goal in mind because i think a lot of people don't really have a clear destination for their studies they just like okay i'm gonna study one hour today one hour tomorrow but there's no clear goal i i need to achieve this level and how do i measure whether i achieved it did you have any of that how what was your approach yeah so mainly i have two ways of of like getting better and one clear cut was first of all like even though i might get good tables i don't play long sessions first important rule um, because i want to make sure that Every hand I review, um, I'm like, I'm, I can really say, hey, that was my top, that was, that was my top decision I was making at that point. Instead of like, you know, those reviews, like ah, I was I probably missed something here and probably, and yeah, it's fine. So like, once that is the case, you cannot even learn from your hands. And like in-game experiences is, is always the best to learn from. So I pretty much, yeah, two, there was one golden rule, but two learning ways. One is the constant review. Right? It's just like, okay, I review every session. I won't start one before. That's a little different nowadays again uh, because I focus more on playing. But back then it was really more time in reviewing than in playing. And um, the way I see poker or cash game poker or any form of poker is for me, it's multidiscipline sports. Right? It's really, we have different disciplines. And it's one key element to understand in which discipline we are and to get better at them step by step. Right? It's like, my example is always decathlon, right? 10 different disciplines. Um, and well, what do those athletes do as a training? Well, the last thing they would be doing is the whole decathlon, right? Never ever they would do 10 things in training. So obviously we need to play every day, which is pretty much just competing. But for learning reasons, well, well, you're working on, on throwing, you're working on, on like hurdles, you're working on, on long jump or whatever. So you try to be as precise as possible. And this is what I try to do. So I break down the whole game to certain elements, right? There are certain disciplines where one first thing is even that, even when I mix them in a review, because it's just the hands that I played, I always want to have that clear, very, very clear awareness. What am I working at? Right. It's a three bad pot in position. I'm the caller. I have like headline for all those spots. That is reaction game. I right? would be okay. I'm in a reaction game. That means he has the advantage. He is pretty much setting all the parameters of the game tree, right? He starts C betting, choosing sizings. Well, then once he checks, okay, then it's up to me. Uh, but that's the start of the hand where then, well, I need to understand his game plan. Right? It's like, okay. It's like, is he range betting? Is he betting multiple sizings? Is he just betting one big sizing? What does that mean, et cetera? What are the options? How should that board be played out, right? To know exactly where I'm at, what I'm learning, and then go with my certain process through that of like, okay, what would be right, right? Double checking, what does the solver tell me? What is villain potentially doing wrong? And what is the right exploit, right? Would be the last step where in the beginning, I clearly focus on number one, what would be right. I want to understand every spot. That's my goal, right? One key goal. And that is the, the constant thing that just depends on the hands that I'm playing. But obviously doesn't really, gets me better step by step. But you see the problem of having different, multi, uh, uh, different disciplines pretty much at the same time, right? I first... I might review early position versus big blind. Then it's blind versus blind. Then it's a four bet pot because that's just the way the, pot, the spots get thrown at you. Um, so in my reviews, I even try to at least go position by position to have certain spots that, that come up, right? First I have early position versus big blind, middle position versus big blind. 
I mean, that's pretty much the same thing. Um, and then the second big part of studying is I had big spots. So I did a, did a list with um, like all the spots that I think are there in cash game. Um, and I cannot, I cannot evaluate how good I am in those, but I can evaluate how good I feel in those. Right? So it's really like, okay, I feel super, I'm confident here and that's already a big plus. Maybe someone finds big leaks there, but I don't know. That's all I can do myself. And then I have spots where I'm unsure, really, really unsure. And that were the first I tackled, right? And then I have usually a big topic of the month that I try, okay, I go in depth there. I want to master that. And with the goal in mind that next time that spot comes up, I want to have that great feeling because I know I know that spot better than whoever I'm playing against right now, right? Because I just worked on that, right? The first one was, ah, oh, my big blind defense was way too passive, right? Uh, speaking about post flop. So I worked on check raising ranges, how to build check raising ranges on certain board types in the big blind. How do they look like? Make my own rules. I always try to simplify things a lot. And then the next hand, I, well, or ne the next spot, well, I, I defend big blind versus under the gun flop is queen five six and i know exactly how much i should check raise and which hand types i should check raise right next board is big blind versus cutoff king eight deuce rainbow well it's like i know again which hands to check raise and and why and have my gold rules for that so i have a new spot where i feel super confident and this is well my next spot was Blind versus blind was my biggest problem, right? I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the tight, like I'm always, I'm a knit by heart. So I like all the tighter ranges. Um, so blind versus blind, I decided, okay, that was my next topic for the month. First thing I did was realizing that topic is too big to be one topic, right? So actually what I did is divide and conquer, right? I made three topics out of that. Right? Um, and well, then tackled every single one of them by like, okay, right, it's one thing is I can range bet the flop. Then it's all about turn continuation. Right, okay, I have a game plan for that. Let's say king 10-4, I don't even need a flop play because I'm just betting range. Even though the solver says I should check my ace nine like 2% of the time, right? It's like, I don't care. I just simplify that or something else. Let's say the other way, four, five, six with the flush draw. Well, I'm checking my range. Even so, uh, even though the solver might tell me to bet 5% of my pocket eights, I don't care, right? I check my range. So actually I need to, simp I can simplify that again. What do I need to look at? Well, how do I play versus a bet? That's the next thing. Or how do I play after check, check, delayed game, four, five, six. What happens if the turn connects with a straight? What happens if the turn is a king or a queen, etc. So breaking those spots down to get better at those. And then obviously vice versa, Big blind versus small blind. Well, someone is range betting. What is my raising range is the first question, right? So it's like going through that all the time and then step by step where now I feel I'm in, in, a, in a state where I can predict solver stuff for 95 plus percent for sure. Um, or like my simplified strategies to it that I might not nail the solver, but I'm super happy with it. And this is how I want to play it. And just... Some spots where I'm like, oh, I'm unsure, but I'm happy with that. And uh, can I'm like my part part one, I always call it is like what would be right is, is what I think I improved a lot over the last eight months or 12 months. And now it's about, okay, to see that next part, what are villains doing wrong? How can I adjust there? Okay, this guy is three betting too tight. So this is my perfect answer. This guy is always bluff catching. Well, that answer is kind of easy, right? Or that guy is super passive. How can I navigate through there? And this is where the beauty really starts, where now I'm focusing on like playing, yeah, only higher stakes to make it really interesting instead of that, that Zoom 500 is just perfect for getting the hands in to really, oh, spots come up and I can realize, oh, I'm not really sure in those. Right? Where now this is kind of over and I try to, okay, this is now, I want to decrease the player pool I'm playing against to really be more precise. I want, to, if there's a recreational, well, he will have all kinds of tells. I want to know them right now. I have maybe some idea, but I could be way, way, way better in that area, right? Then there are 
oh, there are certain regs that I've never seen on poker stars before that, well, I, I just, so far I just marked them as field player. We're like, that, that doesn't tell me anything. It's like, could just means could be anything, but it means for me right now, focus on what he does because notes can be super valuable. Right? Yesterday I had someone who went for a zero, zero, zero percent solver play. That was like totally off. I were like, okay, but I understand his thought process behind that, which is, well, he did not lose EV in that hand. Right? It's like he, he made like a ridiculous turn check raise against my overbet in a spot where you are solver wise allowed to check raise like two or 3%. And he to took a hand that has like, is like totally off for that. But mm -hmm. it was like some kind of blocker, whatever. And he puts me on a draw kind of like, it was like really him saying, I put you on a draw. So I race and then I check call you off on the river. If the draws break, we're like, okay, that is not, does not fit in my system, but that player's system in his head, how he's thinking is just very different. And it's my job to solve that puzzle. Right. So it's really that, yeah, new, new stage that I got into, uh, kind of. Mm -hmm. Wow. A lot of great stuff there. Let me, um, sort of circle back to two points I want to stress, because I yeah. think <laughs> these are really, really important. I mean, first of all, your approach of taking a month for a topic, I really love that. And it's, it's been what I've been doing for, for years now as well. And, I really felt, at least in my game, in my studies, a huge shift when I started doing it the same way. Um, because what happens is when you dedicate your studies to one topic, a lot of things start to click together because yeah. you're just so ultra-focused on that specific situation. First of all, you, you're scrutinizing your, your decisions in-game much more uh, for those situations, right? And it's much easier to identify exactly what you're unsure of because the more information you have, the more information you gather about the spot, the more understanding you have, uh, the easier it is to see that this is, I'm actually, I'm not entirely sure about it. Whereas when you don't have that knowledge base, it's much easier to, to have a feeling that I sort of know how to play this. And to dismiss it as like, well, I, I probably know, right? So you're more aware, more acutely aware of your weaknesses and things start to click much, much easier. And uh, and even when you sp switch to a next topic next month, you can use a lot of the knowledge base you, you gained. It's really for one. me about really that constant asking of why, right? And then using a solver to, to just like give you the answers, right? So mm -hmm. working with a solver there for me is really like, I'm the boss, he's just my little stupid uh, employee who gives me perfect answers, but they are always as complicated as the question I ask it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, I want to have very, that's what I mean with the, with the I need to, to, to ask the why, right? And very, very precise, right? For example, I could ask you, well, let's go back to that example. Queen, five, six, rainbow, big blind versus under the gun. How should my check race range be structured? Uh, so I'm my clear question is, I want to know which hands are okay, first of all, right? Not talking about frequencies, about sizing, whatever, right? It's like, okay, first structure, I can double check that with a different sizing structure will, will stay the same. Okay, I have a clear idea. I can try and learn from that and make my own rules to understand that, to apply it to different different similar spots in game. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing would be, okay, I can ask the same question. Hey, which sizing is preferred on queen five, six rainbow to check race with? By the solver. Uh, okay, hmm. I run three different sizings. I get a very clear answer. I try to understand why. It's like, okay, what am I attacking? Which hands of villain do I give trouble? Where then, okay, now I understand lots of stuff. And the next step could be, hey, actually, villains are not playing that spot like the solver. So what should, what could I change a little to even exploit my villains as like in my general game plan already? We're like, okay, people are probably c betting that board too wide. So I like even higher frequency small check raises against that. Because mm. if you see that all your ace tens on queen five six and you face a check raise, well, you're fucked, right? So um, 
because yeah, I mean, it's obvious, right? Um, and just that step-by-step -step improvement. And now coming to that, what I think gives me the biggest benefit now, once you really went in depth through a topic like that, there are even more questions, right? It's like turn continuation after check raising, right? It's like, once you do, when you do not go in depth, it's like for you, it's the same, whether there's like a flush draw on the board or a backdoor flush coming up, it's like kind of the same. What about a double flush draw? How does that change things? It's like, that, that needs time, right? And then what I think I feel the best in-game now is I can evaluate whether my, my villains got it, right? Because I spot mistakes way, way, way clearer. I, I, I spot wrong hand choice, flop. I spot wrong sizing. I mean, wrong does not really exist, but it's like not the sizing I use, so something is different. Mm -hmm. And then... I see, okay, totally wrong turn sizing continuation. Well, that's, that's, yeah, I mean, I could give you infinite examples now, but this, this is not about being a theory lesson. So it's like really that, um, yeah, you see where they lack, right? And then it's really, okay, a chance to gain reads, right? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, if they, they don't know, what does that mean? They don't have the framework for that spot. Though what happens in game is they look at their hand and does what their feeling tells them what that hand wants to do. It's And then it's like, that makes it easy to puzzle that way back to know like, okay, he has that type of hand. It's like, mm. I mean, I give you the queen five, six example again, turn, best turn cards for the big blind are the eight and the three, right? Completing that seven, four suited open ender and all, all kinds of gut shots and two pairs, et cetera. So, Actually, what is correct is, uh, well, you go direction all in for normal stack sizes, uh, pretty much uh, with this linear sizing, um, which will for 100 big blinds be an overbet in that spot. And you can almost bet your full range. It's just you're pretty much just checking your top few top peers that you that you bet. What happens? People check there way more often because they are sitting on queen five, six, eight, they are sitting on seven, eight, on eight, nine. And they're just like, oh, I have a mid pair. Let's check. Maybe I'm ahead. Instead of realizing how great this, that spot is, we're like, okay, if I face that, that check, I can play per I can play versus hand. I don't need to play versus versus range anymore. Right? It's like, and what happens at the same time, when I face a big bet on that board, I know, well, there's just almost no chance he's ever bluff heavy. I was just like, okay, he needs to realize that he needs to bluff all those peer plus open ender plus gut shot, whatever, because he just has so freaking many nuts now. Um, mm -hmm. We're like, right, this is just where I would say in just that spot as an example where I really evolved as a player step by step um, going through that first understanding it and then taking that into, uh, into the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I really like how you explained uh, your process of asking the why and what it does to your understanding of um, or how it helps you see the, the mistakes of other people. Because when you know, or even how it helps you to understand how you should deviate from the solver based on your opponents not playing like the solver. Because the simplest example would be Let's say if you figure out that the reason we go for this check raise sizing and this check raise range composition is because we're trying to attack specific parts of our opponent's range. This is the why. Mm. And when you know that, well, my opponent doesn't have those parts in his range, you understand that, okay, the whole yeah. thing collapses. Because if you play like this, you're actually not playing the, the best strategy that you could. And same happens when you see somebody make an apparent mistake or even it's easier for you to see that their hand selection is off because you know why they should be betting here, what exactly they should be achieving with the bet. And when you see a hand that doesn't fit that narrative, it's just so much easier to try to understand how they're thinking. I really like the example you, you've mentioned earlier about um, you spotting a field player uh, showing up with that hand where he he was check raising with an idea that he put you on a draw and he would check call you uh, on the river when the draw misses, right? Those situations where you can basically read into the strategy of your opponent are so valuable, where, where you start understanding he's doing it because of this. Once again, sort of answering the question why for yourself. 
It's just such a powerful, such a such a great way to to approach the studies. Hundred percent. And then actually, like, uh, yeah, I just have a hand history in my mind that is my my like latest example for really maximum exploit that I just liked so much, and I'm so convinced of that I made lots of I call it net EV, right? It's like that. There's right. If I have aces, you have kings. If you have kings, I have aces. There's no net EV. We both get it in. But like net EV, really meaning okay, I make something that you don't do and this creates EV for me. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, I was playing a full rank table, I think like random NL1K full rank table. I open raise, let's say the hijack and a knit from the big blind three bets me. Like, all right. First instinct, not instinct, but like database knowledge, he has it, right? It's like the bluffs do not exist, right? It's like Queens plus ace king, right? Maybe the occasional ace five suited, okay, um, but not really. And uh, so, okay, he has it. Uh, I still call. Let's see, right? I have five six suited. Um, flop. I bink it. Is seven four three. Rainbow. Like okay, what does he do? He c bets eighty percent pot. Okay, next step, I have played millions of hands against that type of player. Why shouldn't I take that into account, right? So we could go through that now. Step one, what would be right? GTO, I click the freaking call button, right? If I if I give him a GTO range, but he doesn't have that, right? So that's just, we take that as knowledge. So what is he doing wrong? Well, he's splitting his range on the flop. No way he pots or 80% bets his ace king here, right? Mm -hmm. He has two hands, he has kings or he has queens. and it's like, it's obviously not a hundred percent, but I would take like four to one, five to one, right? I, I give it more than 80% that he has that exact hand. Right? so I suppose it was actually with a flush draw. Uh, might have even been my, my flush draw, just like really like mm -hmm. hitting the shit out of it. Where just, you see where that is heading. My, like, what is the right play against that? Well, I have him beat and he has no, like he will never ever fold, right? Solver is telling me I should always call. I say a hundred thousand percent better here is to freaking jam when you, when you have him beat, right? I take my five, six nut straight. I jam it in his face. He snaps off his pocket Kings. And this is what I mean with net EV. Do I stack him when the, when the turn is a five? Do I stack him when the turn is a six? Do I stack him when the turn is an ace? Um, so actually, like probably 20% of cards where I do not really stack him. Um, and that's the EV I just created by, well, I was I was playing against a freaking hand knowing that that won't fold uh, instead of playing a range. If he in reality had his queen jack suited with a backdoor that might stack off if he hits a top pair on the turn, etc. cetera. Um, and obviously my play is shit, right? But that's just how sure can you be? How strong is your read? And if this guy has like 2% three bet out of the big blind against early positions and plays overall 19, 16, six, well, that read is just not, not strong. It's just a fact pretty much. Mm. Yeah. And, it, and it's definitely great that you mentioned this example because it just goes to show how important it is to not just follow the solver blindly, I think a lot of people fall into the trap of, especially on the river, I see so many crappy calls on the river. And then the hand review that the player does, they quickly look it up on the solver. And the solver says, yes, you should have called. And Frequency that's where the discussion call, 50%, ends. 50%, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know, for them, it's like, oh, the solver says, yes, it's okay. And we're leave it at that. We made a good call. And I feel it almost like, Deep down, you know you made a mistake. Then you try to find a justification of a machine telling you that no, no, it's great in the silver land. This you is can what you're supposed it up. to do. It's an excuse, like the exactly. good old. Uh, I call it the Dominic Nietzsche effect. Right? It's, <laughs> <laughs> he was the first of like that German crew playing high rollers that just kept working nonstop with the solver, and that he and he like misapplied it in my eyes. I think he's still convinced of that, right? But um, in my eyes, he misapplied that um, when it was against like non-GTO players. If villain strategy is not to copy the solver as well, you need to deviate from that, right? So it's like, I remember a hand that he played against a weaker player. And uh, he was like on a pure bluff catch 
um, for like three street, but it started being a bluff catch on the flop pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. And then developed in a way to be like a nice mid set blocker once villain overbets the river. We're like, yeah, it's a flop fold. <laughs> it's like, like something like that. And then Dom tells us the hand and like 10 of our friends were like, yeah, it's a flop fold. It's a flop fold. And then if you get there somehow because you misclicked on the flop, it's a river river fold, right? It's like super clear. And now talking about net EV of that, let's say 100,000 chips you lose on the river. It's like you lose net 100,000 chips, right? Because he always has it. And everyone on the table knew, and he's just like, yeah, he's looking it up and it's like a frequency call and he like, it's like, okay, he randomized on the river. It's like, okay, then maybe you didn't lose a hundred thousand chips, but just like whatever you randomized times a hundred thousand chips. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, yeah, that's just the key where whenever I'm, I'm coaching as well, it's like people put me in that, I mean, I don't think that this is a thing at all. GTO or, or like field player, exploitative player, this always needs to be together right? in my eyes people put me in that gto camp kind of which i think is total bullshit um and this is what i like first lesson to to every to every of my students is really that concept of what would be right is what i need to understand to start exploiting but my goal is obviously to exploit right we mm -hmm. talked about that check raise example um i need to i need to know stuff to figure out what villain is doing wrong and then to know the right exploit so actually what i want to be at the table is the biggest spew monkey that you that you see right because that means i i realize so much stuff that i can deviate all the time right if people look up on that nl1k table right villain with his kings me with my five six suited seven other people watching they must mark me as a fish at first thought it's like oh what mm -hmm. a value player just he has it so he rips it it's like how stupid is that look it up show their friend this is what stefan did uh, is he stupid right not understanding maybe the the bigger picture of it so that's really that what i can give to everyone your goal is to be the spew monkey on the table because that means you have you have or the overfolder right can be like just like spewing in a pio sense or or solver sense um and yeah so that that must be your goal because it means you realize a lot of stuff mm -hmm. yeah it's it's definitely really really important what you just said because like it's so easy to fall into the solver trap and then uh, just try to play solver strategy and then you're just trying to be the same as every other average mediocre reg who does never improve um you know and obviously asking why and why is this happening why why the solver plays like this that's where it starts if you don't ask this question you basically can't progress to the next level of understanding and even Thinking about like people who are really so zoned in on GTO and they have nothing else, they sort of forget that your solution is only as good as your input to the solution. If you would put in the range where your opponent has no bluffs, zero bluffs on the river, well, guess what? You don't have the frequency plays. You only even the solver just plays very much like a human would, if because it's obviously like if you if you if there is no bluffs, well, you beat everything. But you you call everything that can beat uh, a significant amount or enough of the value hands, and that's it. Otherwise, you just fold, and it's, there is no more question. That's really it. Where where the biggest discussions I, I had like lately was four bad pots, right? Where it really a lot of stuff happens to then finally having that input that you want to put in the solver, right? Sure, we have a pre-solved four betting range, right? It's like okay for this rake structure, this is the four bet range that the solver tells me. Well, that probably includes something like pocket sixes as a frequency in a four betting range. Well, if I haven't seen it in 5 million hands in my career, it is probably not in there, right? So first step is I can cut those out, right? And actually the four betting range of my villains in my games, even when I play very high, uh, like from time to time, looks different than what it should, right? It's like, I mean, that should does not really exist, but what, what my solver at least tells me. So mm -hmm. it's like, well, if that input is totally wrong, right? If like, I don't know, let's say Zoom 500, something uh, is, is a high rate game. 
um, which forces people to forbet a lot instead of calling. Right? So something like button versus small blind, ace queen off is quite a high frequency forbet. Right? It's like you need to fold to a jam, which makes it very counterintuitive, but you do great against the call forbet range, and that's fine, right? So, but it's not the natural thing. The natural thing, you open raise on the button, someone three bets, what do you do with ace queen? You freaking call, right? So it's really that where we it's like, hmm, do you really follow your chart if you have one? Or do you get that idea if you don't have one? That well, okay, if these are your bluffs and you're missing those. Hmm, that's a big problem, right? It's like, uh, I mean, that's a big problem if I put them in my input in my solver for a for bad pot, when in reality, you never have it. So it's, uh, yeah, and then we see a jack high board and I call down pocket eights because you should bluff all of your ace queen offsuits, right? It's like, mm -hmm. well, you don't have them, so I'm just burning money. It's just that that thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's crazy how many people view deviation from the chart as a mistake, like by default, there's no question in their mind. You deviated from a chart, you made a mistake, case closed. It's, it just seems ridiculous. Like a specific example comes to mind. Um, I, some time ago, I, I used to stream on Twitch and um, I occasionally would put those videos on YouTube. Right. And it was just me playing like whatever. It was 100, 200, 500 PLO, whatever was running. Mm -hmm. And I'm clearly just playing for fun, interacting with the audience. It's not supposed to be instructional. I'm deviating already pre flop. And I tell so every time I stream. And the educational value in those streams, if there was any, was basically in me talking through my decision making process post flop. Right, completely neglecting the preflop, and recently I received a, a comment on one of the videos of of my like two and a half hours of session on Twitch with the live audience uh, from about two and a half years ago. Right, and the guy comments like, "Oh, I think this is like horrible advice from you. I I know that you're a high stakes player, but I'm appalled by." Um, you know, your instructional material because on minute like 12 and a half or something, you defended with this hand and you opened on the cutoff with that hand and this is just horrible advice. And I'm thinking, dude, if you really want to copy the chart of somebody playing on, on Twitch and you think that's how to become <laughs> a winning poker player, that is your mistake. Right, and I and I wish you would understand that this is not the way. Even if you had the chart, right? Because, like, let's face it, if becoming a a winning poker player was a function of you having a good chart, why isn't everybody winning? Because to get a chart, especially in Hold'em, it's trivial. It's not. I really think we figured that out already because we are like one percent of luckiest, luckiest, luckiest yeah, players. Yeah, there, true, right? true. This is the long-term <laughs> luckiest. How I see that and how I explain that all the time because I obviously had lots of those kind of discussions as well. Is that there are two things, right? I, I, I like named those already. Where one thing is that often even preflop is a reaction game, right? So actually. It's not we are opening up the game tree, it's we are reacting to something. So I'm hating those charts. And even though I hate them, mine look, look alike that say, for example, big blind defense. They say big blind versus early position, big blind versus middle position, big blind versus cutoff. I don't give a shit. It's always the same situation in theory. Mm -hmm. What I would need to know is big blind versus 14%, big blind versus 17%, big blind versus 20, big blind versus 28%. Right? Because exactly. everything I do, is well, his position is a tool for me to find out what his range could look like, right? In case he uses a chart, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. then I know it. But um, yeah, it's 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 just that I'm reacting. Or once someone open raises and I think about three betting the cutoff, right? Same thing. I'm reacting to his open raise size, uh, to his size and to his frequency. Yeah. Four betting, same thing. If someone three bets from the big blind, I think about four betting. Well, if his three bet range looks very different than the one that it should be, right? Uh, then my strategy has to be very, very different. Mm. Plus then next step, it's like, I don't want to say it's a reaction game when we are first in, but it kind of is as well. 
us being first in just means we can set the game tree in like in and put it in a for us favorable situation and so obviously we i could say i can react to him overfolding right and say okay i'm opening wider because he's overfolding but it's like that's kind of making predictions so i like to see it rather that way that i uh that i say hey um i'm building a game like my baseline is the chart but the chart is thinking of me playing perfectly versus you playing perfectly and so we have two things to think about and um, two things to work on. I can find out how perfectly you are actually playing. And well, lots of people are doing that and not think about how perfectly they are playing themselves, uh, which is another part, right? It's like, oh, I play the chart. I try to copy the solver. I play perfectly and villain is doing this and those mistakes. This is a take that 90% of my students have clearly. It's like, okay, I'm trying to copy the chart. I play solver like he's doing mistakes and how I find them out, no clue. But actually there's one step more because, well, obviously the game tree depends on the parameters we put into a solver as well. And we can, we can make sure we use the right ones. And what I like a lot is we simplify them, right? Because I can, like for me, the whole show is to get that net EV, him versus me. And a big part of that is me not making mistakes. So um, this is what people do not do really. So my goal is to create a game tree where you potentially make mistakes, where I hurt your weaknesses while I'm not making mistakes. Where, for example, if we solve it, one more hold them example here, button versus big blind, right? Good luck solving ace, queen, five rainbow. You will see one very, very big bet, right? Just make use of your ace, king, ace, queen advantage right, right away you do not really need a small bet and you have a check. It's a pretty clear polarized flop strategy. You can bet like 135% with your freaking ace king and your ace jack and your ace 10 and your ace queen, etc., uh, And then check back your kings and your queen x and your weak ace x and all kinds of air mixed in. Okay, very easy, but that is like, okay, I need, let's, let's think in that terms, right? I need to split on the flop now. So I need to know a C betting range how it's structured, I need to be know a check back range. Um, villain faces a very, very large bet. So actually he only, he doesn't really need to race in that spot. So he needs a call and mainly he needs to fold. So I put him in a game tree where he cannot make any mistakes pretty much. Right? The mistakes can come on the turn that he just like cannot make the right relative folds, etc. But actually I force him to play correctly on the flop in a way while I make my life difficult. Another way we can put it in the solver and are actually solver wise, which means perfect versus perfect. We are not really losing much EV is I only offer myself a small bet. Right? I can play that ace queen five, totally different strategy, 25% range bet. What happens? I don't have any flop decisions. I know exactly my turn range and villain, well, uh, he needs to react to a freaking small bet. That means he needs to have a raising range. He needs to have a very wide calling range and just a few folds where actually I think I make my life easier and his life tougher. And I can, I can, right. I can make different game trees for different player types there. I, right. But I only can do that once I understand the bigger context, mm -hmm. right. I see it the same way. If someone in zoom 500 sees me see that small there, and make, making fun of me, right? It's like, I can see that. It's like, <laughs> that's a big bad boy. It's such a stupid idiot, right? Um, probably missing the check raises he should have, right? Or then overfalling the turn. Um, right? It's just a different way of creating and understanding that. And maybe that that helps those solver uh, guys a little that there's, there's more room to play around with than just sticking to what perfect versus perfect player says would be the correct strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. I, I'm, so, I'm so glad you mentioned uh, this example. It, it's also my approach of thinking of, do I force my opponent to make mistakes or is, is my opponent more likely to make a mistake in this line or that line? To me, that's been always obvious, uh, even before uh, we had solvers, just always thinking in these terms. But coupling that with the solver, what you said which should be obvious to, to everybody, but it's not, which is 
the difference between one strategy or the other in EV, that's going to be tiny. There is sometimes not such a big deal whether you have a full um, large bet or just a small bet. In terms of EV, you might be losing a tiny bit in one of those options. But that's solver versus solver. Whereas if in one of those options where you're on paper losing a bit of EV, your opponent is actually going to have a lot of mistakes. In real world, you're actually making, and, and making for me, a that, huge plus that play. regard, really the biggest part, me making less mistakes. Right? So that's yeah. why that simplification. Well, when my game tree starts on the turn, that's a pretty, pretty cool deal, right? It's like, mm. okay, that range, I don't want to tell you guys to range bet all the time on the flop, uh, could be a range check instead as well, right? Um, but it just like, well, puts you in a position where you know exactly what you're having. And then it's yeah. okay how to re, how to work with that. That's next step to find out, obviously, right? Yeah. But uh, but yeah, that's that's two things to look at, right? Making it yeah. are there spots where you can, and that's the beautiful, most beautiful things when you find spots where you can make your life easier at the same time when you make villain's life tougher, actually. And there are quite yeah. some spots like that. Oh yeah, there's a lot of them. And for those who are still not convinced, there are let's call them solver. Uh, or anti-GTO skeptics, right? I, I want to tell the example of uh, which kind of was really surprising. I don't know why it was surprising to me, but I'll tell you the story and then then we'll dig into it. So I was I had um, uh, the world chess champion, Vladimir Kramnik, twice on the podcast, right? And I think on the first uh, conversation we had, he mentioned some, because I asked him about uh, the way he approaches studying chess and the way he works with his students and how the solvers come in, the chess, the chess engines come in, because mm -hmm. obviously Kramnik was uh, uh, involved with the Alpha Zero, the super powerful chess engine in, in the, you know. So anyway, I asked him the question of studying chess and his response was really surprising to me at first, because I always thought of chess engines as the ultimate truth. And it's funny because I don't agree with that statement in poker because there are so many ways to deviate and so many ways to do better. But in chess, I somehow had this illusion that no, but chess is the final word. And he said, well, you know what? A lot of uh, younger generation of chess players make a stupid mistake of following the best line offered by the chess engine. Just looking at the numbers and let's call it the plus EV, the most plus EV play, and they just go for it. And he's saying that the mistake here is they neglect to think about which positions does it lead to. Is it the type of position where you're comfortable and you're less likely to make mistakes? Or is it the type of position that your opponent is more comfortable and less likely to make a mistake? Because the game tree doesn't stop with that one decision. The game tree doesn't stop at that super plus EV flop play, which is just a tiny amount better than the other type of flop play. But you would be way more comfortable in that kind of SPR situation with that kind of range versus range composition on, on that board. And we neglect that uh, in poker a lot. And um, to it's, me, it was just surprising that it's the, the most, same in chess. In chess matches and that 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 it fits perfectly right it's exactly the same thing that those matches what is the most interesting thing usually for for the viewer or to think about in my opinion it's it's the opening right which which is the game state they decide to go into right when mm -hmm. they prepared something championship it's like here is maybe there is i don't know a, a max ev opening kind of right but in reality, they are like, I don't know how many. And it's about, oh, let's choose a game tree that I probably think I'm super comfortable that I prepared and I put him in something. Oh, I, I have no clue how many there are. Let's just say there are, there are 30 viable ones. And then, uh, well, it's just, you need to find the, the bottom five that villain did prepare the least probably, right? Mm. But you are super comfortable with. We're like, I can make you for a certain board structure or let's say like a let's stick to button versus big blind we can make we can play 10 different game trees right it's like okay some of them are obvious some sizings just should be in there sometimes for for lots of spots right to just have have a small sizing to allow you to fold shit that still has some equity is just 
often in there, right? Um, but still, I could say we can play different. We can play different strategies. We can play quarter pot only. I can play fifty percent pot only. I can play a mix of thirty and hundred. I can play a mix of this and that. We're actually well. You won't even know what my stretch is, right? Just mm. seeing that I bet 30 this time doesn't tell you whether I range bet 30 or whether I play a strategy of 30% and 100%. Where And this is important to understand the solver as well. If you run solver versus solver, it's like solver always sees villain strategy. It's like solver knows that he only bets those hands 30% and, uh, and not 100, right? Or if it's a mix, he knows that as well. Where, well, villain can try to find that out over time, uh, if you play the same strategy over and over again, uh, which, well, I would recommend playing the same strategy over and over again because it makes it easier for you. Um, or obviously, if it was like super, super high level now, we could prepare three different strategies. They are all good options. Right, Where right now, I'm not saying, okay, there's such a genius, genius villain that and I'm such a genius that I prepare three different strategies. That's not where the EV comes from in poker. That would be like a maybe end game heads up match in X years from now, right? Uh, that people think in that way. For me, it's more like, okay, I have two or three things prepared in mind and I try to adjust that to the villain, right? I'm playing in it. So I'm rather forcing him to play lots of hands. Right? I'm playing against the station. Well, <laughs> I start with the big bets more, right? It's just like, okay, right? I force him to fold because I don't, he, I know he makes mistakes there by calling too much, or I force villain to call with small bets because I know he likes folding. It's like very, very easy approach to start with, but it's not like at that discussion when that's the best and most stupid discussions when people ask me like, is it better to bet half pot or two thirds pot here? It's like, right. I don't give a shit at all, right? It's like, and the solver will tell you that you win or lose one cent, uh, but again, perfect versus perfect. So it's not the reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because oftentimes people forget that what really changes in whether you choose the larger bet or or the smaller bet is the rest of the game of your game tree, the SPR yeah. on every street. So it's equivalent, because as you said in in chess, the top grand grandmasters basically select um, an opening which they prepare themselves and they think their opponent is less prepared to do so, and eventually what it is, it's just preparing an opening that leads to a specific middle game. Yep. And obviously at the highest level, everybody is comfortable playing any sort of middle game. But at the lower levels, you know, at the 2000 rating or something, some players have obvious leaks in, let's say, close positions. And they're not very good positional players, but if you allow them to attack, they're going to be really on top of their game and making a lot of aggressive moves and making your life very difficult. And to bring that analogy back to poker some people are very good at polarizing their range on the river and you basically without making a mistake making a correct bluff because they understand the polarized range they understand the spr but what if you change the spr to to such an extent that polarizing your range on the river is not no longer the best option right all of a sudden they're out of their depth and same goes for if you change your bet size and SPR changes on the turn. If your opponent is not good playing against merged ranges, but you can force him to play against the merged range, but he's still defending as if you have a polarized range, well, guess what? Again, you gain some EV, mm -hmm. right? And even just thinking in these terms can help some people understand why just blindly following what your solver is, is saying is not really a viable strategy in... Um, in the in in real poker and i mean obviously if you just follow to the t if you're really playing the gto exactly as it is and your opponent happens to use exactly the same sizes as were in your input tree because if he's using different sizes by definition his range is going to be different so by definition your gto solution is not gto Right, But if, let's assume, your opponent actually plays the way he plays, except with a different range, but the sizes are the same, sure, your GTS solution is still going to be profitable and basically following your uh, solved DV. But that's very rarely the actual best you can do in the real games. And yeah, that, that's 
the thing, like really don't be overconfident there. You will make mistakes as well, right? It's, it's just, if you don't have a real-time assistant, you won't nail the solver solution. So you will make mistakes. That's just for sure. Mm. And uh, by having a more complex strategies, you will make more mistakes. So it's not, obviously you could say you can just copying that. It's totally fine. That's by definition, you cannot lose them. Well, if there was no rake, right? But mm-hmm. definitely you're not winning. Like your 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 goal should always try, uh, should always be to, to play versus weaker players. And uh, that's not really making use of that either. Yeah. Anyway, so how about you tell me more about this t-shirt that you're sporting right now with poker code because we've been talking about the theory and i think there was a lot of really good um really good insights for people and you've been talking about coaching people so tell me more about poker code so um yeah that's that's uh, probably right now out there kind of in my eyes a, a misunderstanding that or, or like will be soon for sure um that when people hear poker code, same for me in the beginning, it's like, oh, that's Fedor's tournament course thing. Right? So actually um, what changed is that this is not just a tournament course. It's now like a full MTT training ground right now with all kinds of life coachings uh, on a weekly basis. That's all kinds of, you have all the lectures from like that MTT course whatsoever, right? Uh, it's the place to be if you want to want to get better in a community there. And um, yeah, now, like with my way of like how I did things, right, going back to Germany and planning on like more having a, a steady lifestyle, I was finally ready to to put more thought into that and want and thought always about like creating. I, I enjoy coaching so much. And I finally started doing something. And then we figured out that actually Poker Code is uh, and will be the perfect place for me to deliver um, cash game content. So, so far Poker Code um, didn't do any cash game content so far. I had some some guest coaching uh, coachings where I always try to, to sneak in with something that works for both parties, right? Really, I know that the, the um, what's the word? Like that people, the identification in the poker industry is pretty strong, whether you say I'm a tournament player or, or I'm a cash game player. So. What we're doing now is actually not two different products, but it is a new product. So the beautiful thing is just, okay, you just, there's just one paywall. It's not like this product, this product, and then you have that. And uh, what I want to do and what lacks in the industry the most, I feel like is uh, there, there are great things out there that give you 150 hours of content material, but what happens in reality no one is watching it, right? There are some impulse buys uh, for for big money, whatever. uh, And that's like, okay, you get all that material and that makes you a crusher now. Where, well, my approach is very, very, very different because to make you a crusher, like that's only what you can do yourself, right? So uh, what I can offer is to give you guidance, right? It's really, and this is what I focus on the most, now creating the first, content sections it's really that things fit together i mean if you if you listen to me talking when playing or now even in that podcast you see that i have like pretty clear images of how things are right talking about action game reaction game different disciplines and i really want to take that word kind of training ground that you have you have different tools to work with to get better at certain stuff right you cannot get the perfect player overnight but you can divide and conquer and split things up and get better. And my role in that whole th- show is pretty much to deliver that, but to give you the guidance as well, right? It's it's a, it's a subscription model on a monthly basis. You get all the MTT stuff as well. And now we will over time um, give you more and more cash game content there as well. So it's really, I can tell you already, first lesson on there is uh, probably a video how I explain things, how I see things. And then the first content is is uh, how to approach poker. Will for sure be the first video, how to approach the whole thing, how to learn, how to get better, how to how to learn efficiently, effect, effectively. What's the difference between those two, for example? Um, how to make poker a business as well. and um, And then it's really about... There will be spot by spot work, right? Let's say, obviously there is something like check raising the big blind, but it as well, 
bigger concepts, right? If I say, okay, reaction game, action game, well, obviously check raising can be, is, is fits in a way into both, right? It's like reaction game first, and then we start to take over initiative, right? Then I will have something, I compare those general concepts to, I talked about sports before, like general fitness, right? That can be something, well, if you're a fitter, you're the better sportsman at whatever you do, probably, right? So that is if you understand concepts better, you are overall a better poker player, but some concepts work in that part, some others there, right? Let's say one concept could be bluff catching. Very, very easy. That can be in a four bet pot for stacks. That can be the river in a small pot where someone steps 25%. What is the logic? What to think through, right? And um, there, I want to really build that in a way that it's easily understandable and uh, always lots of praxis. So pretty much my goal is that you have, okay, you have a concept, you know where that is applied. Maybe some month from now, you have like 10 different spots there for that concept. And for all those spots, you have, let's say, live session or a session review from me as well. How do I do th those things? Um, it's just like jump in there. Let's say we talk about preflop. It's about open raising loser when nits are behind. Well, then that's something I can just sit down and play live and explain right? um, after we, we had that content. And um, yeah, one big thing is really that I want to make that accessible for everyone. Right now, with all that solvers and that talk about that, I always feel like poker is a thing that, okay, only attracts nerds from now or, or not. It's like, whereas I think it's such an easy game once you explain it in the right way, right? It's like, I won't run any aggregation reports, for example. I don't want to learn by heart what is the correct seabed size on ace seven deuce and ace king deuce, because I think that's not the way, how not how I want to teach it. So actually it's like thinking about who is this for actually? For me, it's like, I enjoy talking poker with everyone who's motivated to get better. So it's, it's really, it, it can be, I think any, any NL 500 grinder can learn something from it, but the person who just likes to play a live cash game around Friday night can take something from it as well. It depends on, well, it's, it's all up to you, right? I, I give you the guidance and that can look a little different and be a little customized and the material. And then it's about, well, what are you willing to put in there? And um, it's just, I will play some high stakes as well and we'll start streaming again that to really show that that's not like kindergarten concepts, but that's exactly exactly the ones that I apply on NL 5K and 10K um, so far successfully. So I hope that will that will stay like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's awesome. That you know people will be able to see that not only does this make sense on paper, but it works in practice. Because I feel like there's a lot of material out there in in the poker education world world where and to be honest in any education world where people talk more theoretical concepts which are easy to buy into if you you read something or you hear somebody saying oh yeah that absolutely makes sense but would it work in real world would it really work in the real tough environment right and that's that's definitely good to see that First of all, great to see that you're doing this and uh, people are going to be able to definitely improve their game. And uh, what is your hope, actually, for people who get into this as, I want to see if I can be a professional poker player? Is this course for them as well? Uh, can be, um, but not really. It's more having that that fun and learning, right? I'm like, not that, well, it's for me, for lots of people, I feel like out there it's, um, ooh, I need to do that now. How, how much content do I need to, how much do I need to study where I want to make that something fun, right? It's like, mm -hmm. cool. I have the concept. I understand it. I put it into, into praxis, right? I have the session focus that fits to it. This is just that understanding why instead of, right, seeing a chart, this is how you should do it is, very, very, very different approach already. Right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing, I just want to make it accessible because most of the courses or material out there 
has a pretty, pretty sick paywall, right? It's like, okay, you get 40 hours of material, you pay like one, two, three K, whatever. Um, we're like, that's that's not for for someone who wants to get a little better in his Friday NL200 cash game private round, where just, well, that's just, will be, that's the goal and will be like that, that it's like, I don't know, the poker code training ground right now is like $99 a month or something like that. And you get everything. It's not like you get the full course and cash will just be on top. So it will be, it will be separated uh, rated in the way. So for all the cash game players out there, it's you won't get distracted by all that MTT bullshit that we don't need, right? That their, their ICM and their 20 BB uh, kindergarten games we're not interested in, but uh, that that will be a thing. But it's just well, and the the what I think people could see as a disadvantage, sure, 100. percent But this is how I want to do it: is really taking the hopefully couple of people who who want to start the journey with me from second number one take take their hand pretty much and guide them to school right that's kind of the concept there will not be a landing page with 50 hours of content material right there will be i don't know first five ten videos um and then step by step evolving that that thing right you can obviously wait a year and then you can sign in and and have all of that but the most valuable part is actually for me the way I'm going to structure it, right? It's like, there are no secrets. Like I, there won't be a YouTube video, these 12 poker secrets make you a crusher, right? It's like, this does not exist. Um, but poker for me is not like, it, like, like an alphabet goes from A to Z or from like 1.1 to 20.5. It's way more connected in different ways. Like with those concepts, with, with stuff that, that is transferable to other spots, and maybe some spots that are not that much transferable. So I ha hate is a strong word, but like I don't like those courses that start with 1.1 preflop, two point something postflop, uh, play out from the big blind, play from the button. Sure, that will be spots, right? I will have some numbers in there as well, so don't nail nail me on that. But uh, it's more that that I say, hey, this is the concept that is applied here. You can train this and that to get overall better at that. And uh, and right, it's just like yeah, evolving step by step in the right areas. And I'm the one to show you in which way you can achieve that. Yeah, so I guess it's definitely valuable for people who are going to be first in the program because the material is going to be evolving based on your on their feedback. I would assume. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Uh, sounds great. How excited are you to get into this project? Because obviously, this is going to take a lot of your time. I would assume. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, I did lots of, or I mean, not lots of, but but quite some private coachings, and I always enjoy it. But uh, I just feel like, okay, there are lots of sessions that I give over and over again, right? It's like, okay, they, they pay me a fair price to just like spend my time. But I think, okay, on the one hand, it's somehow stupid use of my time, right? To just like, I do the same thing I, that I did like two weeks ago for someone else. Okay, it's a little customized, a little for your situation, but especially like first or second lesson, how to approach poker, what is important. Sure, you can have like 10 minutes of questions, but the, the, the ground structure is the same all the time, right? There's no, no secret that like, one, as long as I don't know you better, I cannot give you customized content. I just tell you what I think is important. Um, and that is something uh, that kind of, I think is not perfect. And the second thing is that I get so many requests of people that I would love to help. Right? It's like, I because I enjoy it so much, but uh, I can, I mean, I just cannot use my time to to like uh, help every NL25 player who writes me on Instagram. That's just, I need to select there uh, what I do with my time. And that's the way of combining that, right? It's like, maybe some of the content will be too, too uh, difficult is the wrong word there, but like too advanced maybe for, for an NL10 player, but I try to to keep things as simple as possible that they make sense to really, yeah, help everyone there and kind of yeah get that to really uh, help 
more people, reach more people. And, um, and that's, I'm like super thrilled for it. So um, yeah, right now I'm waiting for backend devel development um, and to, to finally really, I, yeah, to, to really, really, really get started from my side. I'm ready to start any day pretty much and uh, waiting for some, some feedback and then, yeah, that's time, time to start. Mm. Well, I guess, and also like by the time that we publish this uh, podcast, then uh, you guys already have launched most likely or not. Anyway, <laughs> the I listeners will, can will most likely have announced and not launched yet. I would say. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So, but anyway, the people will have all the links in the description if they want to look into it, sign up, or just find out more. And of course, also all the links to your social media are going to be there. So, anybody who wants to send you a message and ask if you want to do private coaching when they're, <laughs> you know, then you can direct them to Poker <laughs> Code. So, all of that uh, is going to be is going to be there. And uh, I feel like we covered so much ground, and it's really. It's really great to hear your approach um, to poker and just your passion for the game really comes through. Your passion for studying the game, your passion for playing the game. And, you know, I'll, I hope that the situation with the German government, um, I mean, I know that you're going to figure it out either way. Next time we talk, maybe you're going to be in Vienna. Maybe you're still going to be in Germany. We'll, we'll see, I, but I'm I sure. Knock at, I knock at your door, door in Malta. Who knows? Or, or that, yeah, or that. Uh, so, and, and in fact, come over. I, I think Fedor might be coming over uh, at some point. So, you know, we can we can make a, a little <laughs> live podcast studio here and, and, and do some fun things here. So, yeah. Anyway, Stefan, is there anything else you want to leave people with today? I think... Uh, all cool. Yeah. I mean, it was super, super fun again to be here. Just talk about, especially life, always interesting just to talk about what, what's, what's up in our mind. And then, yeah, just like dropping, dropping some, some poker stuff. And I'm super happy that, that uh, you at least feel that I'm like, uh, yeah, how, how motivated I, I, I sound because it's mm -hmm. just, yeah, what I have to say, like one positive thing about Corona that, that, it, yeah, the, the fire, for poker got back there that was uh, really really cool right right that that's awesome that's great to hear and uh, best of luck with your new project and best of luck still at the tables um and uh, who knows maybe soon we do a part three and maybe we do it live here from from my uh, let's studio <laughs> <laughs> let's see anything possible Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Check out the description. And of course, I'd highly appreciate if you subscribe, click like, spread the word about the podcast. Also, if you'd like to receive a regular newsletter with my key takeaways about each episode, go ahead and subscribe to it on runchexpodcast.com. That's R-U-N-C-H-U-K-S podcast.com. I write those myself. I take it seriously and I really enjoy the interaction with the readers. So I hope you'll sign up uh, and I'll be back for you next time. Thank you.